Hello and welcome to Exploring Multi-Hub Hybrid Events with Sina Buente. That is the title of this episode of the Event Manager Podcast. Join myself, Miguel Neves, the Editor-in-Chief of EventMB, and our Deputy Editor, Dylan Monarchio, as we speak to Sina about fascinating range of topics around the ICA Congress 2020, a multi-hub hybrid meeting that featured eight hubs all around the world. We talk a little bit about the, decis- the strategic decision of actually creating this event and the quick turnaround time that it had. We talked about the bringing the experience from past hybrid events from the ICA world and also from PCMA and taking learnings from those and applying them to this unique format. We talked about the complexity of coordinating an event like this and the need for close collaboration with local partners and stakeholders all over the world. We talked about the feasibility of this type of events for associations and corporates and the costs involved and we talked about the advantages of creating digital content in this and any other format. I hope you enjoy this episode of the podcast. Make sure you subscribe if you're not already subscribed and leave us a review and a rating. We'd love to hear from you and tell your friends about the Event Manager podcast. So on to this week's edition of the Event Manager podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Event Manager Podcast. My name is uh, Miguel Nevsh. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of EventMB. I'm joined by Dylan Monarchio, the Deputy Editor. And our special guest today is Sina Bunte, CMPDS. And we're going to be talking about exploring multi-hybrid hybrid events with Sina. Sina, welcome to the show. Uh, how are you? Hello, guys. Yeah, I'm good. Good. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. Uh, you are you know, one of the few people that I know that's really been exploring hybrid events uh, in, in your roles and have really been looking out at this, this kind of interesting part of, of the world. And depending on where you're listening or when you're listening to this podcast, maybe hybrid events are normal. Maybe they're uh, something that never happened. Maybe there's something in your future. So hopefully you can get something out of this episode and kind of understand the experience. So I'll just jump into the first question. I mean, you know, we're talking about multi-hub hybrid or or hybrid, I guess, as, as a bigger term. Can you tell us a little bit about your your experience so far with hybrid and maybe explain, you know, your relationship, I guess, with hybrid events? Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I first, you know, I think uh, got to know about hybrid events, like attending attending the PCMA Community Leaders event, or I don't know when it was the first one, 2014, 15, like when they started implementing the online component. Um, and for me, that was really, really good to attend virtually because I wasn't able to go to the US or I wasn't allowed to. So at least I could join then virtually, which was really, really good to get the education and network a little bit with an international audience. Um, And then last year, um, I was working for ICA, the International Congress and Convention Association, and like everybody in the industry, we had to transform our events to uh, online uh, and then ultimately also to hybrid. So um, uh, the first events that we had like in May and in summer, we did fully online. These were smaller events. Um, But then in November, our big ICA Congress uh, was coming up and we decided to do it in a hybrid multi-hub format which mm. was a, a crazy project and which we pulled off in a couple of months so we only started with the preparations in in july in summer so okay this, so you had yeah. about five months four months something like that yeah let me let me like, backtrack a little bit so there's a pcma event you attended uh for those who are not familiar with convening leaders uh was it like four or five thousand people attend in person mm-hmm. something like that the big mm-hmm. pcma event and you participated a few times in the hybrid version what type of hybrid is that the pcma event is it is it you know when you're participating online are you you know you have a stream you participate is it are you connected with the people who are on site or is it a sort of like separate but live mm-hmm. experience how would you describe that one yeah i mean good good point i mean now probably they might also change a bit of their their model but um back then like you know 2015 uh, 16 17 whatever it, it was when it started um it was mostly that we had a stream so we were we were watching a couple of sessions selected sessions that they were streaming live to the internet 
but they also had moderators specifically for the online audience, which I really, really enjoyed. So, yeah. and what they did always, they placed like a studio in the convention center in a very busy area. So you had the two moderators or one moderator interviewing people there uh, while people having lunch or having a coffee break, etc. So we as online audience, we could feel the buzz that was in wherever it was, Vancouver and Boston and, and see the, the, the thousands of people that were there so I really had this, this feeling of the FOMO, right? The fear of missing out. I really yep. would have loved to be there. And this is what you should create with, uh, with, with hybrid events as well. Sure. So, um, so in that And you were part, watching the, the main sessions, right? So it wasn't all the sessions, right? You, no, it you wasn't, had like the keynotes. It wasn't all of them, but I also think a couple of breakouts. So they had really a lot of sessions that they broadcasted live. Um, and we were able to ask questions and then there was a chat moderator specifically for, for us online audience. And then they were brought to the, to the moderator. to the speaker. So there was a, a link, yes. not necessarily yes. a link, continuous link with the two audiences, but there was a link in terms of you asking questions also from the online Correct. side. Yeah. So okay. for the educational point of view, we were able to participate. We could, we could ask questions. Um, but, um, yeah, we couldn't really talk to people on site. Let's put it that yeah. way. And th their focus was really education, provide education for, for the wider industry, um, which yeah. worked really well. And then of course sure. we had the networking among us in the chat, I remember, and the other <laughs> online participants, um, but yeah, just not so much with the in-person delegates. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, I think it's important just to, to, to identify these things and understand how these events work and, and, and the design of them. So let's talk a little bit about your event at the ICA Congress 2020. You said you had four or five months to prepare, a little bit of a last minute pandemic driven decision. Um, how is that different to this experience? Because this experience that PCMA created is, is already quite impressive. I think they've been doing it for, for a long time, which is really interesting. It's not a, a pandemic uh, kind of uh, experience that the pandemic kind of drove. Um, but what did you try to do that was different and why did you go in that different direction? Yeah, I think for us, what we, so the thing with, with ICA is our audience is really, really global. So we, like, or ICA has members around the world. So, and, and in that, and that's because we wanted to bring together most of the people possible. So, and in person. Because the ICA members are, most of them are CVB, the convention bureaus and venues. So everybody who's involved in in-person face-to-face meetings. So obviously we wanted to like set an example for the, for the entire industry and, and everybody who's organizing events that in-person events are possible under certain circumstances, um, even during a pandemic. So that's what we wanted to showcase. And we work together with the destinations and the venues and created eight hubs then around the world. Um, and depending where our members are and where it was possible. Um, because back in November, we, th we know, okay, in, in, in the Americas, so in North and South America, it wasn't possible. So we said like, okay, for them, we've, we focus on a fully virtual um, experience, but for other areas of the world, it was possible to meet. So, I mean, we were supposed to go to Taiwan uh, in Kaohsiung and uh, there they said like we were COVID free so in November we were able to have 200 people there and uh, it, it wasn't an issue for them to meet with large groups and have this big event um, and then we had smaller hubs around the world so like another one in Asia or two other ones in Asia in the Middle East in Europe in South Africa um, and yeah and we basically we did that because we wanted to really set an example um, and also showcase obviously the destinations which are our which are the ICA members that it is possible to meet what do you have to do as requirements what are your learnings um, you know experiment I mean it was a big experiment for all of us involved I think but that's yeah. sometimes what you have to do if you have to if you want to innovate if you you know if you want to change things you have okay. to experiment well can you, can you break that down a little bit further so yeah you know, there is a headquarter in Taiwan, right? Or there's one of the hubs, so to speak. And there's a, a stage, there's 200 people there. And then you have uh, stages and small audiences, 50 people, something like that, in seven other locations around the world, right? Mm -hmm. So where are the speakers? Like, where's the content coming from? 
Yeah, so I mean, the main hub was, so to say, in, in Taiwan, but also in the UK in our studio. <laughs> so we had a the, the technical... And that's where you were. I was in Amsterdam. I, I couldn't travel <laughs> anywhere. That was one of the challenges for us organizers. But um, so the, the, the technical production team was in the UK and it, it was there because uh, the ICA president was from the UK and it was very important for us that he was able to go to the broadcast studio to be there and that we don't have to record like him from home, et cetera, but he can be in a TV type studio. So, um, and from, so that was basically the hub for all the technical connectivity. And from mm -hmm. there, we connected then to the, to the hubs around the world um, where we had stages, what you said, and a program. So some sessions were, um, well, very, very few were pre-recorded, um, some, but some are live, but with remote speakers, for example, from the US or from some, some other places, um, and then from Taiwan, um, and then the hubs. So, I mean, what we did is that we started the event with a four-hour broadcast from we said Taiwan, um, but we either welcomed from UK, from the studio in the UK or from Taiwan. And then we had remote speakers or speakers live from the stage in Taiwan. And then after these four hours, the local programs basically started in all the different hubs, but they were also broadcasted. So if I was an online attendee and I, I couldn't travel anywhere, or I, I didn't want to, then I could choose between like eight streams, sometimes parallel. Okay, which one, which one do I want to uh, look at which which one did I want to follow so that's basically um how we did it so okay so let me get this straight for the online audience you had essentially eight streams mm -hmm. that were happening from different parts well sometimes you only had one right if there was a keynote or something like that but at some point you had eight different pieces of content going on that you could tap mm -hmm. into and you could participate online okay if I'm in in person at a hub how does how is that different then do i have i guess if i'm not in one of the main hubs i have on the screen uh, a pre-recorded or a, a stream of something happening somewhere else right so i have a sort of feed into that hub and then i have content sessions that are also then being transmitted right but there's also kind of in-person activities i think yeah. i believe right mm -hmm. yeah correct so in the mornings when we had this, this four-hour broadcast and everybody around the world saw it basically on a, on a screen except if you were in Taiwan and the speaker was there live on stage and then after these four hours um, the local the local participants in the hubs they could either um, well they they had the opportunity to watch it also on on their phone or on the computer uh, any other stream but they, they were somewhere in a, in a venue so they watched what was going on on their stage mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, and later on, they could catch up on the other streams if they want. But of course, if you're somewhere, you watch what is happening there. Yeah. Um, we had a couple of sessions that were really interactive because, I mean, obviously, right? If you go somewhere, you have to, you have to provide the, the value as well to the people. You have to provide like workshops or um, some sessions where we went to different venues or hospitals or like yeah outside the the venue basically yeah. so um and those sessions we obviously didn't broadcast um because that that didn't really work they didn't really add much value to the online audience so like the experiential kind of things were more just for for the local audience so it sounds to me like you really organized eight events simultaneously yes. <laughs> yeah it's just that it's some mm -hmm. of the content was shared amongst those eight events is that pretty accurate description of what, yeah, what yeah, happened. Yeah, it did. Yeah, and it, uh, for us organizers, it felt the same that we basically organized eight events uh, at the same time. And um, But yeah, I mean, that's that's. I think that was about right what we could, could do back in November 2020 um, mm -hmm. to enable most of our members to meet in person uh, locally. Um, so yeah, I think overall they had this one experience, I'm attending the ICA Congress, um, no matter where I, where I was in the world. Um, but also what we did, and maybe that's also good to highlight is, I mean, we started the program basically six weeks earlier because what we have to keep in mind now with this hybrid component, right? Like before the event and after the event, everybody is virtual. So all your participants, all your members, 
all your community people, they are virtual. So that's what we started doing. We, st we continued, or we started the Congress in September with the entire ICA membership. And everybody was able to join a three hour broadcast educational sessions on the platform. So we introduced the platform to the entire ICA membership, showing them what will await them uh, until the next, uh, for the next six weeks. Um, and then after that, end of September, October, we then closed it for only registered people. We had webinars, uh, educational sessions and networking opportunities um, until then the actual event in November. So that also emphasized the one event experience for everybody because they all started already in September or October when they registered. And then in November, they split up into, I remain online or I can go somewhere in person. Okay. And, and is this, this, this is not what you would normally have done for, for the ICA Congress, right? Correct. No, usually in the past, ICA Congress was a three, three day event somewhere happening in yeah. the world. So you maybe have some sort of promotional activities and things happening before, but yeah. the link, this sort of build up and, and different kind of things happening before that was pretty, correct. pretty and unique. There was also, yes, yes, definitely. There was also never a digital component really associated to the ICA Congress. So we never streamed any sessions or um, re recorded them, provided them afterwards on demand. So that yeah. was really um, the first time, yeah. And, and in terms of this sort of flexibility that you had, I mean, I, I would assume that was quite hard to achieve, but um, you know, this idea that some destinations are able to have an in-person event and then maybe the next day they, they're not able to and you can kind of switch them in and out of the program or have the program be delivered in different ways, depending on what the condition is. Could you talk a little bit about that? Because I mean, we, we put an article together recently, I think Dylan worked on it as well, which was about Australia, New Zealand, how they're largely COVID free. But actually, what happens is a lot of times there's updates and suddenly events can't go ahead. So they have to sort of cancel or restructure things really quickly. I mean, this seems like a structure that enables you to do that. But I'm sure that there's complication so that's not easy to do right yeah yeah i would assume no. that sorry <laughs> if you're it's like you're planning eight different events in eight different destinations subject to eight different governments regulations right? yep yep no that's correct and uh we really had to be very flexible and adapt and uh you know be ready to change whatever can happen and it, it did happen <laughs> so and that's exactly what you said dylan of like eight different governmental regulations um i mean for that obviously we work together very very closely with the cvbs and and the governments but um that what what happened on the thursday i think before the sunday of the live event um started in luxembourg um all of a sudden we were not able we were not allowed to gather there with a lot of people. Um, so then um, only the speakers were allowed to go to Luxembourg and everybody else, all the participants had to either change to go to Malaga in Spain um, or to, to the online uh, at, um, um, participation. But so that's a bit yeah. of a shift, right? I have my flight booked and my hotel yep. booked in Luxembourg. It's like, well, you could go to Malaga, which is, I don't know, 2000 kilometers away or something like that. Yes. Um, so, yeah. So I think that's what we have to also learn and adapt to. Like this is, this is, um, you know, that's how it was last year, but this will be still for quite a, some time. I think this being flexible, being a, like, you have to adapt quickly to, to things and, and having a lot of plan B's and C's, et cetera. Um, but yeah, so for then for Luxembourg, we were still able to have the speakers there on stage. Um, and when they didn't have the session, they could be the audience. But obviously, I know I felt really, really bad for the participants that booked their flight and hotel, etc. And I couldn't go. Um, but it was a governmental uh, regulation. And obviously, it wasn't our preferred choice either. And um, for another hub in Sarawak in Borneo, we also had to uh, change plans quite quickly um, because nobody was allowed to go there anymore. So then we, it was a fully online hub. Um, so yeah, um, that's what's happening if you have eight hubs <laughs> around the world during a <laughs> pandemic. But uh, well, yeah, yeah. I assume that there's quite an incentive for the destination to make it happen though. I mean, can you speak a little bit about the importance of your partnerships with government bodies and the support that you receive from them? 
definitely. I mean, I mean, I mean, definitely. I mean, and that's those are our that's those are the ICA members, right? So they they I mean, we work together with them. We said, okay, we want to organize the the ICA, hybrid, ICA Congress in a hybrid format with hubs. Uh, who who wants to host a hub? Let's say, and then there was interest, and the the destinations came forward and um and made it possible so obviously the, this partnership was was really really important and for them obviously it was a good way to showcase their destinations uh, their venues to say like okay we are able to do that these are the the safety regulations that we have in place etc um you can come and we want to be part of that global event so yeah definitely i think partnerships are so so important um with well, with all kind of events and for the association <laughs> industry. So um, obviously that played an important role. And for, I mean, did you receive any special treatment from any government specifically or municipal or broader? I, I wouldn't say special treatment in, in that respect. I mean, obviously they had to treat our delegates and our participants like everybody else, you know, like, I mean, in, 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 in the form of, we cannot give you special treatment that you don't have to, quarantine if necessary I mean that wasn't necessary but it, you know such examples or you don't have to do the the tests etc so um in that respect no obviously we did we didn't we we had the the special like not special but we had um, the venues um put together like the safety requirements and and sometimes we had the COVID testing uh, in some venues or the you know temperature checks etc um but they would have done that or this is necessary for all kind of events so that was not especially for okay. us and well, yeah I, I meant i meant less like you know b a buddy buddy nepotistic special treatment system and, and more towards the like um impetus to create special policies around business events like for example the german government made uh earlier in the pandemic made um an explicit distinction between mass gatherings which were forbidden and planned events which were permitted on the premise that all of these special considerations could be put in place to mitigate the risk within them. So I was wondering if any developments there happened as a as a result or or concordantly with what you were doing. <laughs> I mean, probably for them, it was also a good learning to see what is possible, you know, and what things you have to put in place. But then it was December, <laughs> so we know what uh, what uh, how things changed again in December with the third wave or whatever wave it was mm -hmm. then. All the new variants um, popping up. Yes, the variants, etc. So, I mean, I think it it was a good test as well for them and uh, experience of what we have to do, what we have to provide, how we can support the events industry um, to bring events back. But then, if you know the third wave is coming, etc., then it's, uh, it doesn't matter what you did in November and how well you did it if if mm -hmm. events are not possible anymore. But luckily, we see things opening up again. So Sina, I wanted to uh, talk to you a little bit about the, uh, the learnings from here, uh, you know, because we've talked about the, the Yucca Congress. It was a pretty special time, a pretty special situation. We talked a little bit about how flexible, you know, you have to be, um, but, you know, what, what did you learn from that? And in terms of like, how that may be able, you know, to help people organizing hybrid events, because we're, we're recording this in June of 2021, um, where a lot of the industry is thinking that events are all going to be hybrid, or are, you know, a lot of events are going to be hybrid. If for anybody considering this idea of like a multi hub hybrid, what's your what's your kind of main advice? And, and particularly, I guess, starting with this flexible side of things, which I think could still be very relevant if certain regions of the world um, close down or whatever. Um, I don't know, start wherever you want to start, because I'm sure that there's a lot of learnings there. Yes, uh, definitely, definitely. But um, I mean, first of all, yes, though, you have to be very flexible and you have to be able to adapt to changes. Um, you also have to be flexible, not in terms of, okay, we have to do it now fully online, but also you have to be ready to maybe reimburse registration fees, uh, you know, and what about the hotel room contracts and all of these kind of things. So again, there is a partnership really, really important that also the suppliers, so like hotels, 
venues, etc., they have to change their flexibility in that respect as well, which I think is, is very important and key uh, moving forward. Um, then from, from my point of view as a planner, I mean, obviously then, you know, we talked about flexibility, but then you have to have all these contingency plans. You have to have multiple plans for everything that could go wrong um, because you now have this technical component involved. Um, so, I mean, we had a lot of plans of like, what if the stream doesn't, doesn't work? Or what if the remote speaker doesn't show up? What if the internet is down, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very, very important that you have all these plans and you are prepared for whatever scenario <laughs> might happen. Um, and then also, I think it's, it's important that you trust the partners. I mean, we talked about that. I was in Amsterdam. I was at the ICA head office. I couldn't travel anywhere. I couldn't even do site inspections, which we usually would have done. Um, but you re I really, really had to rely on the partners everywhere around the world and the production company in the UK and, uh, yeah, trust them. So, but again, there, it comes back to very good communication. So also with them. I mean, I was constantly uh, connected to them via, via a team's uh, call. So if there is something happening with a stream or, or something in the studio, then I would know immediately and I can you know, plan accordingly or I can react, um, I can act just, accordingly. Just out of interest and for my curiosity, how many different streams or chats were you in at any one time? Oh my God. Well, Because I'm sure you had a speaker chat, you had the yes. technical team <laughs> chat, you had the feed the yeah. team's meeting that was always going yeah so i mean obviously with with all my colleagues around the world um or the 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 pcos if if my colleagues also couldn't go to any of the hubs so these were alone aid and then groups with a production company and then with the speakers so i don't know i think my whatsapp was was full of these <laughs> groups um <laughs> but this is this is so important and uh, i mean I, I had very good team members and like like Josephine was in, in charge of the education. So she was mostly communicating with the speakers. So if there was any issue with them, then I didn't have to be involved, uh, let, let's say. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, but a lot of groups, but this is the nice part about that we can communicate very, very flexible and easy now with like WhatsApp and Teams and, and, and Slack groups and stuff. So yeah. Okay. Interesting. So I mean, Complex, definitely some some good advice there. But how how does it make you feel about hybrid meetings and multi hub hybrid, particularly? You know, this kind of quite challenging. Uh, do you feel good about it? Do you feel like it's it's what people should be looking at, or, or you know, how do you feel about it in general? Yeah, I mean, it's not something new, right? I mean, big corporations have done it for years, and and big associations like. Uh, European Society of Cardiology or Radiology, they they have they they had this digital component for for many years, and we mentioned PCMA as well. So, but I think um, but those are quite other... different, right? Those are more like the streams with the online it, focus, well, it right? Yes, yeah. I mean, like for the like ESC and and ACR, I'm not sure how much they really engaged with the online audience. But just saying that they always had this digital component, at least. So they at least, you know, had cameras there and et cetera, et cetera. So for them, now, when we talk about hybrid events and we talk about the connect connection of the, the two audiences, it's not so much of it, like, it's not so much work, let's say, and that's not a, not a big challenge. But for, for the other associations and for the other organizations that saw the digital transformation, but kind of ignored it, for them, it was a very, very big impact last year. And it was like, okay, we have to do that now. So, and I think because of the, the pandemic, we speed up this whole process. Uh, usually it would have taken probably a couple of more years, but now we had to do it last year and, and this year. So in this respect, um, it was, yeah, we had to really learn very, very quickly how to do that. And um, I think, in, in the future, you know, like we won't, we won't call it a hybrid event, but we will just simply say it's an event. And with some organizations, they will have the digital component add to it and some not. Um, so I think this is, this is basically what, what we will, what we will see yeah. and, and what we also saw, saw this year. And um, I mean, but do you think that mm -hmm. what are the special set of circumstances that 
will take people to create a multi-hub experience. Because yeah. I, I see a lot of you know events that you know are just virtual for now or, or start to have some sort of in-person component. Uh, sometimes it's a small audience at the studio or something like that, or sometimes there's a speaker coming from somewhere else. But to actually have groups of people physically watching and engaging with each other in multiple places in the world, what do you, where do you see that being a good fit? I mean, it, de it depends, or it's a good fit for, for those associations that want to gather their local communities. You know, if you have chapters around the world, if you have a very, very global audience, then this is a very good, good way of gathering at least them locally because they might not be able to travel from far away internationally or are not allowed or, you know, things are, things are changing. Um, the whole travel, um, how, how we travel and how much we travel is, is changing. So then if you have the hubs, if you gather your communities locally, you at least give them the chance to meet face-to-face, -face, which we all know is super, super valuable. Uh, and they were used to before 2019. Um, so in that respect, if you can create these local communities, this is really valuable. Um, but, you know, probably it depends again on the type of associations, how big they are and how much resources they have, because I experienced it myself that it's a lot of work and you need also, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a question about uh, cost as well and budget and, and resources, how many staff members you have, et cetera. So definitely not all uh, yeah. of, of associations are able to do that. I wonder well, let, if, let, um, oh, go ahead. I, I wonder if, I wonder if, I wonder how the delivery of content online is going to impact that as well, because we uh, we're working on a post now that will have been published by the time this podcast airs um, that deals with, you know, virtual content's capacity to blow past borders and language barriers in order to promote inclusive access for attendees and speakers really. And I wonder if the hub and spoke model could be the on-site answer to that challenge in the sense that it gives access locally to lots of content um, mm -hmm. that someone might not otherwise have access to if it were siloed and in, in one global annual conference or something. Um, and, and potentially I can I imagine that it would also give access to local chapters to open and avail of some of the experience and expertise of the larger of the larger whole. Yeah. Yeah. And this is this is a very, very good point. I mean, the whole uh, discussion that we have now and the whole the benefits of making events more inclusive and more accessible language barriers might might disappear or, or are minimized um, so yeah I mean if you if you can organize local hub events you can have it in their in their local language uh, for example you don't have to stick to like the global language maybe it's English for example but you can have the education in their local language and then uh, if you stream it online, you can offer a translation. So, I mean, you know, this is the whole benefit of, of, of hybrid events that you can really expand your reach and you can reach so, so many more people um, with this digital component, uh, which, or if you do like local hub meetings, uh, which in the past were not possible, uh, for, you know, for people to attend for whatever reason. So I think... This is a really, really, really important topic that we that we should really keep in mind and focus on moving forward. Yeah. But to dig in a little bit deeper on a couple of points there. One is, you know, with with your Eco Congress experience, you had speakers coming live from each of the locations, right? So you had an audience, you had speakers, or some of the locations. Um, how important do you think that is? Because if they were sort of watch parties that were spread around the world, you could still do the networking. You could still have that sense of local community. But in terms of production, it would be way easier to just have a, a big screen or a projection or a cinema kind of setup where mm -hmm. you're just watching some content and then you have a, a networking session. How important is it to have speakers coming local? You know, is that important to kind of motivate the local community to be part of it? Or do you think it would work just as well if there weren't any speakers? Mm. I mean, it depends. It depends on the audience. It depends on the participants. Um, for some, probably it wouldn't matter, you know. And also sometimes, depending on how big the room is, or if, if you're in a huge ballroom somewhere, you would probably see it on screen anyways, you know, with a, with a camera, because you, you sit so far away, you don't even really see the speaker. 
Um, but for some other audiences, it might matter. You know, sometimes they're like, oh, I was in a room with this and the speaker, or I have the opportunity to speak with that person, um, you know, face to face after the session or before the session, if, uh, if possible. So, I mean, it depends. It, re it really depends. Like, I would say, uh, you know, ask your participants, ask the audience, what do they, how do they feel about it? Would they mind if some speakers are not there or, mm. or not? I mean, because if, for example, you, you would have the opportunity to get this amazing speaker um, from, from wherever, and he would never be able to come to your event in person, uh, but he can now deliver his, his talk virtually, I think you should go for it because you can get this education and you can get this content uh, exchange with him, even if he's on screen. Um, and the, 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 like, on the other hand, it would be like, okay, no, we wouldn't be able to get him there, uh, you know, and he wouldn't be part of the program. So what, what do you prefer? So ask your, your members, ask the audience. Um, I mean, it, sometimes it depends, you know, sometimes people really want to be close to that person. They want to shake hands maybe that, with that person. Um, but sometimes it's more important to get that education and to have the possibility to, to speak with this person. Yeah. Even I guess also explaining like who's going to be live and who's going to be on a video feed that could get quite mm -hmm. complex, right? Because if you mm -hmm. have lots of different kind of possibilities, uh, I don't know, in terms of attracting the audience, um, that could be interesting. But yeah. let's talk a little bit about cost, because um, that's, I think, something that the whole industry is concerned about. Um, a lot of people are being tasked to kind of exploring uh, hybrid events. And, you know, just how much more expensive is it in your experience? And do you think that it's feasible for, you know, who do you think it's feasible for? I guess it's probably a good way to ask. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, when I, when I talk to associations, and I'm mostly involved in the association industry, so I'm not talking so much about the big corporations because that's a whole different story but um then it's i don't think it's it's feasible for a like for a lot of the smaller societies and associations because simply it is a like cost factor that you have to add and probably those they uh, those associations they also you know never streamed their content never recorded them never had these additional av equipment in the rooms so for them now adding that is of course like a big big cost factor and i don't think mm -hmm. this is possible in the like now right maybe in the future yes because costs will probably also go down now that it's getting more normal to have um to have this technical component um but otherwise like in the near future it's probably like more the, the bigger associations that can uh, set it off with like sponsorship, for example, or um, getting more attendees, um, you know, yeah. getting more revenue in that sense. So what, I think what you're saying is it's more incremental, right? If you had at least part of the equipment already ready, if you were sort of set up in that direction, it's not a huge difference. Mm -hmm. um, but is an element of that also that associations or any organization needs to understand how to use the content? Yeah. Right? Because one thing is to create all this situation and, and, and make it all happen. But then if you're not really able to either monetize it or use it as a, as a real tangible benefit to your audience, then it sounds to me like a bit of a missed opportunity. Yes. Yes. Correct. I mean, definitely we need to have this, you know, this, this shift in mindset, maybe like thinking, okay, the event doesn't end on that day, but we can extend the, the, the event, the education, so we can use the content that we recorded, um, that we that we gathered during the event, and use it throughout the year. You know, uh, use it post event as well, um, and and monetize it. Maybe you know, you can you can sell that, for example. You can you can offer it to your members after the event. So definitely, that is the you know that the shift that we have to to realize and to make that. The event is not only these three days, but extend it and use the content that you created. Um, and yeah. Yeah. And I mean, do you see hybrid as, as the future of, of the industry? I think that's, that's a big question. And if you had to kind of think about a percentage, let's say associations, in terms of the association events that are happening, what percentage do you think associations will be doing hybrid events? you know, this year or mm -hmm. next year? Mm -hmm. Well, this year, I, I would say 
20 percent you know very <laughs> very low um although everybody said 2021 will be the hybrid event year um but it's still there's so much still going on in the in the world that it's not sure where we can meet in person um and and also how to do it i think a lot of planners are still not sure um about all this uh, technical component and organization so and as of next year um i think then you know most associations really really want to go back to in person um i can you know i talk to a, a lot of associations and i can really get i have, I have this feeling that they all can't wait uh, to next year when they have the opportunity probably like to, to get to go back to in-person and it's without a lot of risk that they have to change it back to online. Um, and then some will add the digital component, you know, uh, but some also won't. So uh, in, in terms of a percentage, I would, I would maybe say, God, I, I, I don't know. It's very difficult, right? I mean, it, because there's, there are associations about everything and all kinds of sizes of big and small with a lot of um, budget and, and with, a, with a smaller budget. So, and I mean, also depend, like it, you can include the online component also in a different way. You don't have to do it during the main event. Um, and I think this is also what we will see is that maybe the in-person event will be an in-person event without the online component but you engage online with your audience, with your members throughout the year, maybe, or weeks before and after, and then online. So, hmm. I mean, maybe, I don't know, if I, if I have to tell you a number, maybe then I would say like 60%, so maybe more than half would actually do a hybrid event. Um, but I mean, let's see, let's see how it is actually, how it's going to be. I I think you raise a really interesting point that you don't have to do hybrid events to have a hybrid strategy that is orchestrated around a combination of virtual events for those events, for those content-driven programs that are really amenable to virtual, and then in-person components that you know, are more about ne networking and, and having that face-to-face -face time and driving that face-to-face -face value that's not even really derived so much from the one-to-many content delivery uh, system that you often find in in association related lectures. Um, so, so that's really interesting, but I'm, I'm curious more like about the hub and spoke aspect of it and that the future of hub and spoke as a, as a strategy and as a mechanism. And I know a lot of global associations already have a de facto hub and spoke kind of, you know, strategy for member engagement because there are a lot of local, locally relevant things that they want to deliver. Um, but in terms of cost, as it pertains to hub and spoke, obviously you're in some sense multiplying your event cost by eight, for example, if you're planning eight different events in eight, eight different locations with eight different AV setups, if you're doing that. Um, is there, is there a, a cost incentive such that you have more things to sponsor or more value add to your local members that you could potentially charge a premium for? Or mm -hmm. you know, can you talk a little bit about the, the ROI for doing that Mm -hmm. um and how that yeah. impacts the budget decision yeah i mean yeah obviously if you have if you have hubs and these satellite events around the world your budget is impacted but then on the other hand what you said you have more sponsorship opportunities you reach a wider audience you get probably more attendees to attend the event so you you have um, more revenue in, in terms of registration costs um and if you include remote speakers um, which your audience might be totally fine with then you save a lot of costs as well in flights and in accommodation so in you know in that respect obviously the cost will will go up if you have in-person events around the world but you can offset that with getting more sponsorship money in or, or fundings or um, other revenue opportunities okay and I think to wrap up, what would you, what, what's your advice to, to people looking at this kind of format, either a, a more simple hybrid or a, or a more complex multi-hybrid event? Having lived through it, what advice could you give your, your fellow planner community friends? Um, I mean, obviously, it's always good to know your audience, right? That's what we always say at the beginning of everything. You have to know your audience and your objectives. So I would I would say, you know, ask, ask your audience ask your members like how did you like the online component last year and maybe beginning of this year 
Um, would, do you think we have to have an in-person event again? Yes or no, you know, like, do, do you need the um, online component? And if they say yes, then okay, then go for it, organize a hybrid event and find, find a way to, to organize it. Um, but if they say no, like for example, this, it worked perfectly fine. We don't have to have this event uh, in person anymore, then, then don't, right? Because things are changing and, and what, we, what we talked about. So don't, like, don't go back to the, the mindset that we had before the pandemic, that we have to have everything in person, et cetera. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so I, I would check and also like ask your, your other stakeholders, right? They're not only the participants, but all stakeholders have to be involved, like your sponsors, your organizers, the, the, the destinations, et cetera. If they find it valuable to have this event as a hybrid format, then you know, you know the answer. Um, mm. And then obviously um, what, what, I, what I experienced also, because for us it was like a very, very steep learning curve and I wish I would have, you know, more case studies to read or more, or, you know, be able to take a course within a, within a day to learn how to do it. Um, but, you know, now, like, and if you haven't done, have not done it yet, do those, those courses that are out there. There are so, so many out there. Like, it's the DES course from, from PCMA. There are these courses from Event Leadership Institute. Um, I just finished one about AV and technical production, which I found really valuable. So um, there are a lot of resources out there that you can learn how to, how to do it, um, but also realize that, that you are not alone, right? So we are, the events community is, uh, is, is very supportive, I think, in that way. Like there are Slack communities, there are Slack groups. Like um, I join every, every week, like a, a technical meetup for event tech chat. So where we talk about these technical aspects and give each other help and advice. Um, so, you know, just to realize that there are other people in the same shoes and a lot, maybe when, when it's, when you plan that, that have done that. So reach out to them and ask for their experience and, um, learnings and tips that they have, um, or involve experts, um, really in that, um, a good, you know, production team or consultants, et cetera, like realizing you are not alone with that. So <laughs> get the help yeah. if, if you need it and collaborate with uh, with people and then i would really say like don't be you know don't be afraid but experiment um this is how we get innovation like step out of your comfort zone um and uh you know ex experiment a, a little bit with it and, and and try it yeah so really you're not alone don't think that you're alone right that's uh, that's an important part of figuring all this out great Lots message Tina. thank you for that sorry Gil? i was just saying lots of resources yeah. yeah, exactly. And come to eventmb.com. We have lots of resources about this as well, of course. <laughs> exactly. Um, but um, wanted to ask one question. We're asking all our guests, and hopefully it doesn't put you on the spot too much, but we'd love to have a recommendation from you of uh, someone else that we should invite on the Event Manager podcast. Oh, God, there are so many amazing people out there. Um, Great. But... <laughs> <laughs> and this is good, right? It's positive. That is really positive. Um, but if you if you want to focus a bit more on on this, you know, communities and 365 engagement and, and, and stuff, which we shortly touched on, because it is definitely part of a whole another hour of talk. Um, but then you could uh, invite Mat Matthias Fleming um, for for one of your episodes. He uh, he's uh, he's one of my former colleagues from ECA, and now he works for open social or community engagement platform. So um, I'm sure he would be really good to interview, to talk about this, you know, uh, engagement throughout the year um, and extending your event life cycle. Thank you very much. We'll definitely uh, connect. And I know Matthias as well. So we could uh, bring him on the show and, and get his, his view on this. Sina, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure and always good to talk to you about this topic. I know you have some exciting projects coming up. Um, is there anywhere that if people want to talk to you, connect with you, is there anywhere that you'd recommend people get in touch with you? Yeah, sure, absolutely. I mean, I'm on, on LinkedIn and Twitter. You find me, just look at my name and my handle is Sina Buente. So you find that. And uh, you also find my company on Instagram. Twitter and the website digitalmind.events. So feel free to reach out. I'm always happy to chat and uh, talk to people. <laughs> awesome. Excellent. Thank Looking you very forward. much. Looking forward to hearing more about it. All the best to you. Take care. 
Thank you. Thank you for listening to this edition of the Event Manager Podcast. Please subscribe and rate the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. For the latest news and the best articles on technology and innovation in the event industry, head over to eventmb.com.